question to you. How many of you, please, um, if possible, raise your hands? Who are historians? All of them in the majority. Uh, I see. Okay, maybe the proportion will be even a little bit different in this case. But uh, I want to start with the, uh, with saying that uh, uh, the most recent big book about Russian history, written by Hindemeyer, uh, gloriously fails to mention uh, central peripheral relations in the Romanov Empire altogether. Uh, so it is a kind of a uh, very strange uh, exercise. Uh, if uh, we look at possible reference book for uh, these um, issues in German language, inevitably it is popular. It is uh, uh, mm, mm, uh, the Russian uh, Tsardom as a multi ethnic empire. Ruslan Tsardom, I see, if you have it's a very erudite book, very rich in detail, very rich in uh, ideas. There's one problem with this book. Uh, it tells us a lot of things about all ethnic groups in this empire, except one, the Russians. Uh, so you can compare it to a big, big picture where the middle is missing. Uh, Exactly as a reaction to this book, which was published in 89, uh, of a very prominent British historian, Jeffrey uh, Hoskin, published a book, uh, um, uh, Russian, Empire, uh, Russian People in the Empire, uh, where he focused exactly on uh, the role of empire in Russian nation building, uh, and he came up with uh, how to put it, a very um, standard and uh, widely known idea that the Russian Empire uh, blocked the development of the Russian nation. And that was, and still is to a lot of extent, uh, so to say, uh, the wisdom uh, with which we operate. Uh, I think it is all sheer nonsense uh, because. Uh, in Russian Empire, as well as uh, in other major European empires, we have uh, the story which tells us how empires were building nations in their European core areas. When we talk about French nation building, it was taking place in the imperial metropolis. When we talk about British nation building, it is the same. Germany, as soon as they created what they called a nation state, they immediately embarked on an imperial uh, endeavor. And Italians did the same. Uh, when we look at Spain, uh, dynamics of imperial contraction were extremely important for how nation building in Spain was developed. All these stuff. Uh, is at the core of the book which we edited with Stefan Berger, uh, which has, uh, if I remember correctly, eight case studies, or well, nine, if that was Spain, France, Britain, Germany, uh, Hamburg monarchy, uh, where Austrians were deprived of a nationalizing project, but Hungarians were not deprived of it, and in their southern part they were pursuing the same. And uh, we also <clears throat> cover Ottomans and so on. Uh, so that brings me to the case of Romanos. Was empire an obstacle in Russian nation building? In certain areas, yes. But on the other hand, empire was quite conscious actor in the process of nation building, and I would say a leading and the most important factor. And what I'm trying to do in the chapter uh, about Russia in this book is to tell the story how uh, Russian imperial rulers, together with 
Russian intellectuals before intelligentsia and the rulers of empire uh, quarreled uh, so deeply uh, in the late 19th century, how they developed a project of Russian nation building, which was partly a reaction uh, to challenges which were coming from imperial peripheries. First of all, the posture. After the Russian Empire swallowed too much of Poland, and it couldn't digest it properly, so to say, uh, from the point of view of imperial interests. Uh, this competition, uh, also discursive competition, about what, how we should understand this lens of partition of Poland. Because Poland, a uh, Polish idea would be that we need to recognize that uh, these areas are populated not only by Poles, but also by uh, Slavs, by uh, Rus, and also by Lithuanians, and we have to build a coalition to fight China. And Moscovites, or Moscows, as they would refer to them uh, in Polish discourse, were not Slavs. They were this align to this community of East European civilized Slavic people. Uh, they were Turanians. They were Asiatics. Uh, of course, Russian discourse. Uh, was doing exactly the same, excluding Poland, saying that we Eastern Slavs uh, rooted in uh, Kiev, baptism, orthodoxy, uh, Byzantium, etc., etc., uh, are together, and uh, uh, the Poles have traded their soul to the Pope of Rome and basically are lost to the humankind, etc., etc. And punished by partitions for the other here. Uh, now, they developed the whole very coherent uh, structure of historical narrative and uh, uh, cultural policy, uh, which was aiming at creation of a Russian nation which consisted of several, so to say, branches. Great Russians, Little Russians, White Russians. Uh, some Russians were cut off by the border of empire and were living uh, a uh, terrible life under the rule of Habakkuk in militia. <coughs> uh, um, this narrative of um, little Russians uh, who were not little because they were little, but because they were uh, Russian Mikra, that is the original Russia, uh, was a narrative which was, how to put it, which can be compared to the German narrative of uh, uh, those people who live in the Erzaz, and if they are not so much German, uh, as we would like them to be. That is because of centuries of the French yoke. And we have to purify them to, how to put it, to recover their Germans. Here, centuries of the Polish yoke also left certain traces, and little Russians and white Russians had to be purified and saved for uh, <coughs> Russianness. However, again, we can compare it to Germany and German uh, strategies in this respect. Such imperial national projects, uh, well, they never uh, pursue, how to, they, they're never trying to be conscript. They're very situational. Uh, Russians would insist on their Slavic nature uh, in polemics with Poles. But when we look at how they were arguing about Russian nation building in the region of Volga, for example, where they were assimilating uh, 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 
grown a small uh, female Ugric people, for example, they would say, yeah, of course Russians are a mixture of female Ugric and Slavic peoples. Um, it's a perfect match. Uh, let's marry each other and <clears throat> have fun. Uh, you are very welcome. When Germans were thinking about Mazurit, who were obviously Slavic in their heart of its racial uh, roots, but they loved Kaiser, they were Protestant, so just teach them German language and you can make good Germans out of them. Well, <coughs> in some cases it worked, as we know. <coughs> uh, so, what I'm saying is that these projects were very, uh, well, opportunistic and uh, very open in ethnic terms. Uh, but not to everybody. Uh, Jews were not welcome since, say, uh, 1870s, 1880s. Part of the story <coughs> in Russian case, a very important part of the story, is the expansion of the vision, image of Russian national territory. We have to keep in mind that Russian nation building project never aimed at building a Russian nation which embraces all the peoples and all the lands of the world. No. Baltics are not Russian. Crimea, by the way, is not Russian. It was a typical example of the 19th century of non-Russian land. But up to the end of the 19th century, Siberia was not Russian. It was a strange Asiatic land. Chekhov, when he traveled uh, Siberia to go to Sakhalin, writes letters that they are all published but they are full of these observations that very strange people live here, but very few in common with Russians. Finally, in one of the letters, I finally found a Russian guy here, but he's Jewish. Uh, and uh, of course, partly it is all uh, a calculation to be read and admired by the readers who uh, didn't dare to go that far. But generally, uh, what we have, how we can tell the story, is the story of incredible expansion of this notion of the Russian national territory and also the demographic conquest. We have several directions uh, into which millions of people, mostly Russian peasants, go uh, and then make this land Russian in a sense that it belongs in their imagination and the imagination of uh, the rest of the world, Russia. They started with uh, Volgovision and the idea that Volga is a Russian river becomes so obvious already in the 19th century. Uh, then they continued with New Russia uh, and we are still having some noises about New Russia today, we shall talk about it later. And then they went to Northern Caucasus and what we now know as Kuban and Stavropol uh, were also demographically conquered and became Russian. And finally, across the Urals uh, to Siberia, that is under Stolitian, three and a half million people, uh, some of them great Russians, some of them little Russian peasants, all those little Russians who went there, as far as they didn't meet Ukrainian nationalists there, um, assimilated into Russians. Um, now, Ukrainian lands were not destination for great Russian uh, migrations, but the idea was that these people have to become Russian. And what it means is not necessarily, and 
in general this uh, concept. It was not making little Russians great Russians. It was the notion of Russianness was broader. It was embracing both great Russians and little Russians. When Gogol uh, came from uh, his estate uh, to St. Petersburg, uh, trying to pursue the career of uh, a uh, writer, uh, he had uh, some romantic uh, piece about uh, German knights, whatever. Nobody was interested in romantic pieces about German knights. In the Pittsburgh. Uh, but he started telling funny stories about the land he came from, this little Russia. And suddenly it was a huge success. Why? Because the public in St. Petersburg wanted these stories. They wanted these stories exactly because they saw these stories as stories about themselves, about Russians. Different Russians, but Russians. Picturesque, funny, but Russians. And now, when we look at this historic narrative, uh, it doesn't matter uh, whether we talk about Kruchevsky, who was a liberal person, great Russian historian, or Ilovaisky, who was very anti liberal, still great Russian historian. If we look at textbooks, it is all about free young Russian people. So that was a point of consensus. This consensus, of course, was challenged by the Ukrainian movement. You have to realize that <clears throat> the front line in Kiev, where Russian nationalists are fighting Ukrainian nationalists, didn't run at all the ethnic lines. I mean, great Russians, little Russians. On the one side were little Russians who were Russian nationalists, with the chairman of the club of Russian nationalists, with a typical Russian name, Savenko. <coughs> and uh, on the other side were uh, Ukrainian nationalists who very often belonged not only to the same milieu, but to the same families. And this is the situation before the First World War. Mm. And how it will develop, it's not clear. Of course, war, collapse of empire, and revolution change a lot. Uh, and the question, which seems so obvious, but is never answered properly by my students when I'm asking this question, who was the main enemy of the Bolsheviks? social groups which were suspicious and alive. These were the groups which were part of this Russian nationalism. Uh, of the clergy, uh, um, well, of town dwellers, nobility, etc. So what do we have after the uh, revolution? is an absolutely conscious tactic of Bolsheviks uh, to dismantle, deconstruct the results of this nation-building process, uh, which was developing in the Russian Empire in the 19th and early 20th century. It was a very serious ideological move when Bolsheviks said that we recognize Ukraine as a separate nation, and we create a Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic. The same with Belarus. And generally, we adopt an absolutely new concept of what political organization of this space 
based on institutionalization and territorialization of ethnicity. So, the key issue which we have to understand is that Russian Federation, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, lives on the ruins of two imperial projects. One layer of this world is very obvious. This is uh, the ruins of the Soviet project. This institutionalization and territorialization of ethnicity. Soviet republics went away from Russia, but 22 autonomous republics are still there in the Russian Federation, where Tatar Republic is perceived by Tatars as their national property, and so on and so forth. That means that all this imperial blah blah about building a nation state in Russia is uh, it's total nonsense. I mean, uh, if you want uh, to bring trouble, try to make a nation state in Russia. Then we're trying to do it in Ukraine, you see the results. Uh, simply, certain material doesn't fit the project. And if it doesn't fit, the problem is with the project, not with the material. Uh, now, where is this second layer of the world, this legacy of the Russian nation building, uh, how we can see it? 70 years of Soviet project, it was all deconstructed because, uh, in a sense, that the keystone, the backbone of this project, the idea of three million Russian nation was simply discarded. All demographic mm, occupation, which was so important for this project, was reformed and reshuffled because uh, in the Tsarist Russia it was peasant and Cossack movement. Uh, Soviets were sending Russians uh, to the periphery, but it was workers. These were urban workers, either uh, workers or specialists, uh, doctors, intelligence, etc. And um, of course, um, the, the dynamics are very different in this case. But if somebody thought that it is all gone, there was a very clear signal that uh, it's naive thinking. Because if you look at probably the most widely read political text in Russia uh, after or in the process of this, published in the process of the solution of the Soviet Union, it is of course the essay written by Solzhenitsyn, uh, How Should We Reorganize Russia? What does he say there? He says, everybody in the borderlands, in these republics, is claiming that they would be better without Russia. Fine, let's, let them go. Uh, it's a pity that Baltics want to go, but let them go. Uh, Caucasus, Central Asia, doesn't matter whether they want to go or not kick them out. Keep Belarus, keep Ukraine without Galicia. By now he knows what clever people you at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, because if you want to have a real fun, if you read Russian, but for that you need to read Russian because um, the English translation omits, for some reason, most interesting parts of this text, is the memorandum of uh, Durnovo, which he wrote in uh, 1914, uh, uh, trying to stop Russian participation in the war. And it is February 1914, and 
And one of the things he says that, uh, well, we can manage all these nationalist challenges from the periphery. But if we enter the war, we shall have a um, socialist revolution of this, with industrial consequences. And then he said, and the aims which we formulate for our war are very strange. For some reason, they want Galicia. Okay, we have 100,000 rooms of files in Galicia, but another 500,000 are convinced Ukrainians. What are we going to do with them? Do we really need them in uh, our uh, empire? Stalin annexed Galicia under the slogan, not of the liberation of the Russian land, how it was in the First World War, but under the slogan of unification of Ukraine. It's a new story. Now, Solzhenitsyn wants Galicia out. And he wants Northern Kazakhstan, area where, at the moment when he is writing, Russians constitute the majority. When you look at the map which he is drawing for his readers, it is very clear that somehow, as Atlantis, this concept of the Russian national territory, how it existed before the revolution, re-emerges in his brain. When we look at development in Russia in, during the last, say, 10 years, it's very clear that if there was any real ideological and political challenge for Putin. This challenge came on the side, from the side of Russian nationalists. It was not liberals, I mean, who were doing a lot of noises, but who didn't have power base. Russian nationalism is the last uh, unused ideological Source with mobilization potential, which is formulated uh, in this idea of Russians as the biggest divided uh, nation in Europe, with allegedly 25 million Russians living in Europe. Plus, this concept of Russian world, Ruskimir, which is not that simple. I mean, uh, don't use Ukrainian sources to understand what Ruskimir is. <clears throat> uh, for example, in the eyes of Kirill, who was trying consciously to use this concept as a soft power instrument, not uh, as a kind of a evidentist problem. But it is very clear that this Russian nationalism was the main challenge. And when we look at Russian developments since 2012, the part of the story <coughs> uh, which very often escapes attention is <coughs> the story which begins with Putin, who was elected for the third time president, traveling Moscow in his car, and the streets are empty, completely empty. And also called protest movement at that time is animated very much by the idea that the Kremlin elite is a kind of a corrupted, uh, anti-national elite, which keeps uh, money, wives, girlfriends, kids, doctors, uh, dogs, cats, etc. in Nice, uh, together with their duchess, uh, and that is why they cannot seriously protect Russian interests and think about it. When we look at how it truly developed, we can see how this situation of extreme weakness 
in which Putin was in 2012, with the talented help of the European politicians, was transformed into the situation of his triumph. Because in 2012, everybody knew, I mean, we have economists who were writing by that time, that Russian economy stops to grow. So you have a politically unpopular president who has to explain his population why their salaries are not going to grow anymore, the way they grew since 2000. So they leave him to talk to these people and see what happens. What was the, on the agenda? Who becomes the prime minister? Prokhorov or Kudrin, uh, one liberal figure, another liberal figure, uh, how we can liberalize political sphere, etc. Et then starts this Ukrainian story. And uh, Putin says, well, we want our seat at this table because it concerns us. And your talented leaders, Sikorsky, and others, also Germans, said, no, 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 it's not your business. It's our bilateral relation. Okay, he says, an opportunity. And he started to escalate the states. As soon as he annexed Crimea, he had solved all his problems. Number one. He is Russian nationalist number one. He simply destroyed the space from which Russian nationalists could attack him. So you will make the noises. I took Crimea. I risked my well being. Uh, they wanted to make me the second Milosevic, but it didn't work. Then it turned out that, of course, all the hardships are because of sanctions. Nobody is asking questions about um, economic leadership um, anymore. Uh, and everybody is united around the flag. And 85% is 85%. And so on and so forth, of support. And now it turns out that who is in trouble? Not Russia, but the European Union. Greetings. When you look at uh, the speech which Putin produced after the annexation of Crimea, at this moment of triumph when they were accepting Sevastopol and Crimea into Russia in the fifth century, he used several explanations. One explanation was, so to say, democratic. The will of the people of Crimea is to be with Russia. Second was geopolitical. We do not want a NATO base in Sebastopol. We want our base in Sebastopol. But there was the third point that he referred to this irredentist agenda, saying that, and this is the step in unification and bringing together Russian people who were cut by this geopolitical catastrophe of the last century. And that was the moment when he, for the last time, referred to this. Because all the rest, all these noises about Russia were not coming from him anymore. That is a very optimistic element in a generally dark picture. In the sense that uh, Putin and uh, those who are making for a policy around him realize that these motive is really dangerous. It can get out of control, 
And if you look at what they are doing to people who were active and prominent in this Donbass area, how they basically neutralize them immediately when they're coming back, because they are this potentially very dangerous material if they are left uh, as heroes in the status of heroes. They're not heroes anymore. Either they are dead or they are not heroes. Uh, so, uh, that means that this uh, a legacy of Russian uh, nation building, which claims uh, huge parts of contemporary Ukraine, some parts of Kazakhstan, is there and is a very powerful ideological resource. And very important is why it is so dangerous? Because you can trigger it from various sides, so to say. It is not that Putin can switch it on and off when he wishes. If you create a situation where Russians are under threat as an ethnic group in a certain area, it is very difficult for him to not to react. So this is really a kind of a very powerful manipulative tool. Uh, I hope very much that <coughs> these potential of this event uh, will not help to use fire as this famous Czech rifle on the wall. But it is on the wall, and that is very dangerous. Uh, if only uh, people Such things do not disappear without trace, without legacy. Maybe they would have been more accurate. Because we can see how things become very dangerous again when we see what is happening in Ukraine today. Besides shooting in Donbass, very important is that there is a very powerful movement in Ukraine of, so to say, nationalization, diversification, etc., etc. Because what was initially tr uh, triggered as a uh, movement of diversification, it is very clear that diversification is a very important part of it. What are going to be the consequences? That is pretty uh, unpredictable. So the narrative that basically everybody is trying to forget about it right now, because nobody knows what to do with it, and basically you know, it is a suitcase without capital, uh, but you have it now. Uh, the problem is that uh, it will come to the agenda very soon, not because somebody wants it, but because uh, mm, this uh, legacy of Russian nation building, among other things, will be part of these problems which are growing uh, in this country, uh, which is clear for a uh, careful observer. Uh, thank you very much.